Happy Monday, y'all. It's Brother Evan right here. And I want to talk to y'all about one passage, just one verse. That's all we're going to talk about today. One Bible verse. But this one Bible verse could very well change your life. <clears throat> First John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. 1 John 4, 18. Perfect love casts out fear. We have so many songs on Christian radio about this. We know this. We, we preach it from our pulpits. We love this verse. But here's the thing. Do you really believe it? Is this a reality in your life? I want to ask you a question. What are you afraid of right now? Can you think of it? Maybe think of like two or three things. Two or three things that you're afraid of. Okay. Those things take away from the life that God intends for you. He wants, to, he wants us to live a life of obedience unto him. He wants us to live a life where we're killing sin and we're resurrecting righteousness in our life. And when we're afraid to do that, or when we're afraid of someone or something, or we think something's going to harm us and we have that negative feeling, then it takes away from that. You see, the opposite of fear isn't faith. That's, that's, that's the axiom that we see all over the place. Even in the world, they say, oh yeah, you know, you know, faith over fear, you know, but it's like, well, hold on, hold on. There's only so much truth to that because we're looking here in the Bible that perfect love is casting out fear. So I would posit to you today that faith, hope, and love are the remedies to fear. Faith, hope, and love, all three of those things that we see in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Because here's, here, here, here's how it goes. When we're afraid of something, we're afraid of punishment. Well, the opposite of punishment is love. So there's no need to fear when you have love. But then hope says like, hey, something good is going to happen. It's not something that's going to harm me. Instead of being harmed, I actually have a hope for a future, namely living in the new heavens and the new earth with Jesus one day in the consummated creation, right? That's our living hope. We're going to have our own resurrected bodies. We're going to live in a resurrected creation. It's going to be pretty awesome. Everything good we see here is going to be made better. Anything bad is cast aside and everything else is blasted to kingdom come. That's what we have to look forward to. So I don't have to be afraid of missing out because I have a whole kingdom of God to explore one day when I'm on the new heavens and the new earth. So that eschatological hope that's going to destroy my fear. And finally, faith, I think, is the obvious, right? Instead of being afraid, okay, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? Well, you know what? I know God has predestined everything that has come to pass. He's got all his, all of my days are ordained in his book, according to Psalm 139, 16. And even better, I know that God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So faith, hope, and love. If you've got those three things in your life, then fear doesn't stand a chance. That's a song, right? Fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Because it's easy just to sing it because it's a catchy song. I like it too. But that song is declaring that nothing is greater than that fear but God, and that God is so infinitely greater that that fear doesn't stand a chance if those two went to war. God versus fear, who's going to win? God totally kicks the living daylights out of fear. So thus, we must have a high view of God. We must believe that he is so powerful that the fact that he is the one who spoke the world into existence, the fact that he is in control of whether or not you or and I are going to get another breath, that power, that sovereignty, that's where we find our serenity. Say that again. God's sovereignty is where we find our serenity. So faith, hope, and love in God's sovereignty. Believing God is greater and bigger than all things. The last thing I want to posit to you is that perfect love is Trinitarian. 
and you're looking at that passage and you're like, well, I, I just see God, you know, is there, I see God, the father, but you're actually, if you look at this passage a little closer, you're going to see God, the son and God, the spirit, at least the Holy spirit is implied here. Actually, he's here in the beginning of the passage. What am I saying? So God, the father, right? It seems obvious. That's what we see in the plain meaning of first John four eighteen, where it says that we love because God first loved us. The next verse. If we say, anyone says, I love God, God the Father, and hates his brother, he's a liar, and, he, and so on and so forth. So we got the perfect love is coming from God the Father. But how can he bestow that love? Because fear has to do with punishment, right? If we're in our sins and God shows us love, then God's being unjust. It's like if, a, if it's like if a judge saw a criminal and he's like, all right, you can go free, you're a good person. No, that's not how God works. God is just. The Bible says he will by no means clear the guilty. So what has to happen is that there needs to be justice served and that justice was served. And it's actually the love of God in Christ. First John 4.10, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son. So God, the father sent his son to be what? To be the propitiation for our sins. In other words, Jesus is the scapegoat. Jesus is the one who intercepted the wrath of God on our behalf. So what was happening on the cross was a propitiation in which God the Father was pouring out every single last drop of wrath that he has towards you onto Jesus so that nothing is left in that cup. But now he can pour into your cup and make you start to overflow with his love. And now how does he make you overflow? How does he apply that love, the act of love, that propitiation, that appeasement of God's wrath, that interception of God's wrath on your behalf. How does he do that? Go to Romans 5.5. 5. It says that he sent the Holy Spirit to pour in the love of God into our hearts. That's what it says. So now since the love of God is Trinitarian, right? The Father set his love by sending the Son and the Holy Spirit is the one who applies it. You got all who God is on your side going up against this fear. So, therefore, perfect love casts out fear. You don't, you don't have to worry about being punished if you're a Christian, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, because that's been nailed to a cross. So that's the question. Do you believe that? It comes down to faith, hope, and love. Do you believe it? I hope you do. You have a great day.